Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Carpenter's House live stream Bible study. Wednesday in the Word. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that everyone is having a blessed day today. It's just so good to be able to worship the Lord and to learn his word. Thank you, Lord. Well, praise God. I trust that you love the Lord tonight. I pray you brought your Bible with you to the Bible study. And tonight we're in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14. Thank you, Lord. John 14. We're continuing our series out of the Gospel of, of John entitled, The God Who Comforts and Cares. The God Who Comforts and Cares. And this message, this teaching is designed to remind us that even through these most difficult times, COVID-19, and even as they get more difficult, with the blatant uh, acts of racism and leading to murder, violence, protests, looting, vandalism, and more hurt, harm, pain, and suffering, God is yet the God and that the only God who comforts and cares for his people. And therefore, we find the answers to these and all of the problems going on in the world today by turning to God through the scriptures. So please turn with me to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14. Now, the entire chapter of John 14 is about comfort and the comforter. That is the paraclete, who is the Holy Spirit. And um, we see, we will get to those verses on the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, when we get to verse 16. But uh, right now, let's pick up at verse 6. We're in John 14. And we're going to begin at verse 6. And the word of the Lord reads, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And I'll just stop right there. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful opportunity, Lord, to study the word, to receive the word, and then, Lord, to live it out. Lord, bless and anoint this time in this study right now, Lord. Let this Bible study be fruitful to every heart and every mind. 
every hearer, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And bless the messenger, Lord, to communicate your word accurately, efficiently, and effectively. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, my current theme is comfort in Jesus. Comfort in Jesus. This is part 10. And uh, now the entire, as I've said, the entire uh, chapter 14 of the Gospel of John is about comfort and assurance from the Savior. And in that comfort and assurance, Jesus makes exclusive claims that has drawn the line of demarcation in the sands of religion and he has set himself apart from all others claiming to be somebody. Now, let's come to terms with the truth. No man in history has ever made as lofty and exclusive claims that Jesus has been able to make and to back them up with proof. Now herein is the proof in a nutshell. Jesus claimed to be the son of God, which is a claim to deity. He prophesied that just like the prophet Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, that he himself would spend three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And of course, that is a metaphor for his death and his burial. And he also prophesied that on the third day, he would rise from the dead. And there is an empty tomb just outside the city of Jerusalem that is the proof to back up all of his claims. And trust me, if the unbelievers of Jesus' day could have produced a dead, lifeless Jesus, they would have produced his dead body and paraded it all over Jerusalem. But they couldn't because the tomb is empty because he rose from the dead. Now, I would like for us to look at just a few of those claims out of the Gospel of John exclusively that Jesus has made. In John chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus claimed, quote, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. What a claim that Jesus had water that was oh so different than H2O. In that same chapter, John 4, beginning at verse 25, the woman, the woman who Jesus was talking to at Jacob's well, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Note the he in the text is italicized. That is, it's slanted. Whereas the rest of the words in that verse are just going straight up and down. Now, what that means is that in the original Greek text, the word he, and you find that throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, whenever any words are 
italicized, for the most part, those words are not included in the original text, whether it be the Hebrew or the Greek, okay? So, when we look at what Jesus, his response to the woman, he, the, the verse literally reads, I who speak to you am. I who speak to you am. Or in other words, I who speak to you am the Messiah. This, this is what Jesus is saying to the woman at the well. Which is basically to say, I am. Ego, I me, in the Greek. Only for the sake of the conversation with the woman did Jesus use a full sentence. Jesus uses this name, Ego, I me, or that is, I am, for himself over and over again. And we'll get a little bit more into that in just a minute. Let me move on to another claim of Jesus. I'm in chapter 5 of the Gospel of John now. Chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Jesus claims equality with God the Father here. Verse 17 reads, But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Do you see how Jesus put himself on the same level as the Father? Verse 18 says, Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Amen. So in that statement, my father has been working until now and I have been working by claiming God as his father and also claiming to work just like the father works was his claim to deity and the Jews saw all the more to kill him because they just did not believe who he said he was. Moving on, still in John 5, looking at verses 21, 22, and verse 25. Jesus says this. Here is, this is Jesus' claim. He claims the power to raise the dead. Verse 21 says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. Amen. So we see clearly this is Jesus' claim uh, to uh, have power to raise the dead. As well as we see in verse 22 that all judgment is committed to him from the Father. Amen. On judgment day, everybody will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. There is not one soul that will not stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give account of him or herself. Amen. Now, of course, the judgments are not mixed. They're separate judgments. There's one for believers, one for unbelievers. Amen. In a nutshell, if I just generalize, there's really several judgments. But if we just generalize it, you've got a judgment, a great white throne judgment for all unbelievers. And then you have the judgment seat of Christ for all believers. 
and believers are not being judged for salvation. They're being judged for the works that they've done or what they failed to do for Christ and for the kingdom of God. But those unbelievers are being judged because they rejected the salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. They perhaps thought you could get to heaven by some other means than by going through Jesus. And this is the day they get a very rude wake up call. Let's move on. Now I'm going to go over to John chapter 8. John 8 verse 19. Here in this verse, Jesus claims exclusive knowledge and relationship with the Father. Verse 19 says, Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Because Jesus had mentioned his Father in the previous verse. Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. So Jesus is letting the skeptic, unbelieving Jews know that they don't know him or his father. Saying that if they had known him, they would have known his father. Jesus claims exclusive knowledge of knowing who the father is. Verse 24 of John 8. Jesus claims that those unbelieving Jews, and in turn that includes all unbelievers, not just Jews, but even Gentiles, but that all, but for the sake of the context of this passage, he's talking to the Jews of his day, and he's saying to them that they will die in their sins. Listen to the verse, verse 24, John 8. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And here we go again with uh, Jesus uses the phrase, ego I me. I am. Okay? And this is not to be treated lightly. He says, if you don't believe, that I am he, or again, if you look at your Bibles, the pronoun he is italicized, which means it's not in the original text. It was added for understanding by the translators, okay? But it's not in the original Greek. The verse literally reads, for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. It's very powerful. And here we have, I'm still in John 8. I'm going to go down a few more verses to verses 31 and 32. Jesus claims freedom comes only by abiding in his word. Freedom comes only by abiding in his word. A lot of people think that they're free. Particularly those that are not in Christ, those that don't believe, those uh, that live according to worldly standards and worldly pleasures, they think that they are free. Well, they're only free to sin, and that's really the whole, the whole thing in a nutshell. Because to truly be free, 
is to be in Christ. Outside of Christ, there is no true freedom. Because outside of Christ, see, all men are going to be bound by or to something. Now, you're either going to be bound by your sins or you're going to be bound by Christ. And it's really no gray area. You're either going to be bound by your own flesh and your own desires, which the end result is sin and destruction, or you're going to be bound by the Lord Jesus Christ, which is freedom, which is liberty, which is life, which is abundant life. Listen, there is no life outside of God. God is the giver of life and God has determined a way for man to live the life that he gave them on the earth. But you are free to make your own choice. You can choose to live for yourself or you can choose to live for God. And that is only through Jesus Christ. Even people that claim to be living for God, but they do not claim to live it through Jesus, they also are outside of Christ. And Jesus says, let me read the verse. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, he said, this is John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, verse 36, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's a good place to praise him right there. Amen. Amen. So only abiding in the word of Jesus, can any man be free? My last claim of Jesus in chapter 8 of John, I'm going down to verse 57. Jesus claims to be the great I am of the Old Testament from Exodus 3.14. Verse 57, then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Now, of course, they're having this conversation about Father Abraham. Abraham is the father of Judaism. He's the father of the nation of Israel. Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you if you believe. So let's just praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Abraham, the father of Isaac, who was the father of Jacob, who was the father of the 12 patriarchs who make up the 12 tribes of Israel. That's the Abraham that they're conversing about. And the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. Remember, Abraham lived back in the days of Genesis. Abraham lived back in the day. His, his, name, his name was Abram in the beginning. God changed his name in chapter 17. But he's first mentioned in chapter 11, at the end of the chapter. That was thousands of years before this time. And so this is why the Jews are saying to Jesus, you're not even 50 years old. And they're most accurate. As a matter of fact, Jesus is only about 32 or 33 years old at the time. And they said, have you seen Abraham? Because Jesus mentioned 
Abraham. I think just for clarification, I need to read that verse that comes before. I started at 57. Let me go back. I'm going to just go back to verse 54. John 8, 54. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet, you have not known him, but I know him. There's another claim that he knows the Father and they don't. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now that's the statement that comes unto controversy here. That's when the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And there goes that ego I me again. Jesus says, before Abraham was, that is, before Abraham was even conceived in his mother's womb he is actually saying before creation is literally what he's saying before all of creation I am then verse 59 says then they took up stones to throw at him but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. They wanted to stone Jesus for blasphemy, for claiming to be the I am that I am from the Old Testament. And that verse I'm sure many of you can remember back in Exodus chapter 3, Moses was just having another normal, common day on the backside of the desert, tending to the sheep, and he looked to the side, and there was a bush that had caught on fire. And he noticed that the bush was on fire, but it wasn't burning. And he took a few steps closer to examine what was going on with this bush. And when he got a little closer, a voice came out of that bush and called his name and said, Moses, Moses, take the shoes, the sandals off of your feet for the ground that you're standing on is holy. And this is where Moses gets the great call, the great commission to go back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And so for the last 40 years, Moses has been in the desert tending sheep all these years in preparation to be the shepherd of God's people to lead them out of Egypt. But Moses had a question for God. Moses said, but Lord, when I go, 
they're going to ask me, who sent you? What is your name? Look, I don't want to butcher the text, so I'm going to go there. Exodus 3. Moses said to God, verse 13, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is God speaking to Moses. And he said, oh, you want to know what my name is? My name is I am. Ego I me in the Greek. And that's the very name Jesus applies to himself in the Gospel of John. And that's why the Jews were ready to stone him. Because he claimed to be the I Am of Exodus 3.14. The great I Am. Yahweh, eternal God Almighty, the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth. That's who Jesus claimed to be because that's who he was. Now, to our main text in John 14. Here in our main text, this is major point number six that we're making in our lesson, where Jesus gives his disciples assurance from the Son of God of who he is. Now, if you ask me, there's nothing more important than knowing who Jesus is. The Bible says no man can call Jesus Christ Lord except by the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 12 and 3. And in order to do that, you must be born again. So here's the assurance. John 14 and 6. Jesus said to them, or to him, that is to Philip, excuse me, Thomas. He said that to Thomas. I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is not a way. He's not a truth. He's not a life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one way. One way to heaven. One way to God. There is only one truth and one life. And it's only found in Jesus Christ. There are not many ways to heaven, my friends. There is only one way to get to God the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus said in John 6, 44. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up at the last day. What a claim. Jesus is making the exclusive claim. Exclusive meaning unable to exist or to be true if something else exists or is true. So he makes the exclusive claim to be the only way to get to God the Father. The only true and living God in heaven. And the next major point 
that we look at in our lesson that we discussed last week is more assurance, or that is, we should say it this way, reassurance from the Son of God. And the reassurance is that his disciples have known and have seen the Father through him. And this is verse 9, John 14, 9. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Amen. And this is where we saw in the book of Hebrews how that is possible. How that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And that's because when we look at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, the word reads, this verse 3 reads, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. And we, we saw that through the illustration like the sun. No man can has ever seen the sun. All we see are the rays that come from the sun because the sun is too bright for the naked eye to look upon it. So when, so when we see the sun, we're actually seeing the rays that come from the sun. And so it is like the S-U-N, so it is with the S-O-N. No man has ever seen the Father God. He dwells in unapproachable light. But we've seen him through Jesus. Because Jesus is like that, that direct beam of light coming from the Father that reveals who he is. Seeing the Father is not so much about seeing what he looks like, what his shape is, what his form is. Does he have eyes? Does he have ears? That's not the question at hand. What we are looking at is the character of the Father. And that's where we see in the second part of verse 3 in Hebrews chapter 1, he is the brightness of the glory of the Father. That's that beam. And he is the express image of his person. And the word image there is the word character, which we get our English word character. That is everything about that individual. And see, we know some things about the Father. We know that the Father, that God is love. Therefore, if the Father is love, Jesus is love. Because he is the express image. That's right. That is, he is what you can see. And when we say see here, we're not just talking about natural sight, but we're talking about seeing with the mind, seeing with the understanding of who the Father is. We see his character through Jesus. And one of the, the many qualities or characters of God is that number one, God is love. 
And God is faithful. He's a faithful God. He will never, ever fail us. Even when we think God has failed us, God has not failed us. Because one thing we learn as we grow in our relationship with the Lord is that his ways are higher than our ways. So when we think God should do something a certain way and God doesn't do it that way, that's where we have to trust what he is doing in his sovereign will. Because he's like every good father. A good father is not just going to give his children anything they want. He's going to give them what is most needed. Not that they don't get anything, but you understand my point. There are some things that we are, and we are children of God. We're his children. The Bible says it over and over again throughout all the scripture, how we are his children. And we act just like children sometimes. We act like children in prayer. We pray for things like a child that we do not need or we pray for things that are not good for us. See, it's not good for every Christian to ask God for a hundred million dollars and God give it to them. That particular person may not be able to handle that kind of money. Listen, God knows what we can bear, what we can handle. God is sovereign in all areas of the Christian's life. He's sovereign. He's sovereign over the blessings. He's sovereign over the trials. He's sovereign over tribulation. He's sovereign over persecution. He is sovereign over it all. He knows what we need. He knows when we need it. He knows when it is the best time to bless us with it. And I'm here to tell you, there is never a day that God is not good to his children. God is good all the time. That's all God knows how to be is good. Listen, God is good when he says no. God is good when he says yes. God is good when he says wait. He's good when he says now is not the time. Or there's a, there's a host of things. That I can make a list that runs from here to the freeway of things I want and what I want to see. And the way I think things ought to be. But guess what? God knows best. He knows best. At the end of the day, we have to trust his heart. We have to trust that God knows what is best for his children. Thank you, Lord. And Jesus is the exact image of who the Father is. Everything in the Father can be seen through Jesus. Everything. Everything. There's not one character trait of the Father that cannot be seen through Jesus. In other words, like that beam that beams the rays of who the Father is, Jesus is not lacking in any way showing us who the Father is. This is such a wonderful verse in Hebrews 1. I encourage you to study it on your own. Don't just take my word for it. 
So let's go back to John 14 now. And actually, I want to give you one more verse. And we're about to bring this to a close. But I want to give you another verse. It's, it's Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. What does it say there? And listen, I want you to turn there because I pray that you've been highlighting these verses. But Colossians 1, verse 15, that verse reads, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And it, that verse is speaking of Jesus. It's saying Jesus is the image of the invisible God. My, my, my. That eternal God that is high in the heavens that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Jesus is the image of that invisible God. Amen. And he is the firstborn over all creation. And that word there is translated, he is the preeminent one of all creation. In other words, Jesus is first. That's why he is Lord. Amen. One of the grand purposes for Jesus coming to the earth was to reveal the Father God to mankind. That was one of his grand purposes for coming to the earth. It wasn't the number one, but it was like 1B. <laughs> Amen. To reveal the Father because 1A was to live a sinless life and to die on the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world. That was, that's 1A. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So we see here how Jesus reveals the Father through himself. Amen. Let me give you a uh, let me give you a couple of more passages and we're going to close. John 646. John 646 says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Now, who is he that is from God? That's Jesus. So Jesus is letting us know no one has seen the Father except he who is from God, and that's Jesus himself. Jesus has seen the Father. Amen? And guess what? We just have to be content with that. We have to be... You saw what Philip said earlier in the verse. He said, Lord, show us the Father, and it, that will be sufficient for us. Well, guess what? You're not going to see the Father except through the Son. That's the only way you see the Father, is through the Son. And anyone claiming to see the Father outside of his Son, Jesus, has not seen him. Jesus said it right there. In the verse we read. He said no one can come to me. Unless the father who sent me. Draws him. You can't even come to the father. Unless you come through the through the Son. 
And Christians get bashed about that. But listen, we're just teaching what the Bible says. It's not my message. It's his message. It's not what I say about Jesus. It's what he said about himself and his father. Last verse, Matthew 11, 27. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Jesus said, all things have been delivered to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Jesus is showing us that the Father has entrusted him with everything. Everything in the universe. And Jesus goes on to say that no one knows the Son except the Father. So he's showing us this exclusive relationship between him and the Father. Then he says, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And let me tell you, the one whom the Son wills to reveal the Father. The one that comes to Jesus for salvation. That's the one that Jesus wills to reveal the Father to. Those that come to God as a little child, humble and with faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Amen. Amen. So listen. The Lord, listen, the Lord wants to reveal the Father to the whole world. But he can't. Because they don't want to really know him. Right now, the question is not about what the world is doing or what the world wants or doesn't want. It's about what you want. Will you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Will you allow him to reveal the Heavenly Father to you? Today is the day of salvation. On the day you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. God would that none perish, none, but that all would come to repentance. Will you come to repentance today? Do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, and no man comes to the Father but through him. It's straight and narrow. But that's a good thing. It leaves the plan of salvation uncomplicated. 
It's real simple. Paul said to the Corinthians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from the simplicity that is in Christ. Mm. He said that to the Galatians as well. He told them, look, you frustrate the grace of God. Why do you do that? Just come to God and believe by faith. I want to pray right now. I don't know what your relationship with God is. But if there's any question about whether your name is written in heaven, whether or not you possess eternal life. Listen, eternal life don't start in eternity. Eternal, eternal life starts in this life. The moment a person is saved, born again, eternal life has begun. Jesus said, you have passed from death to life. From darkness to light. Pray this simple prayer with heads bowed before the Lord. Lord Jesus, just say these words with me. Pray this simple prayer and receive Christ as your Savior today. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need to be saved. Save me, Lord. Come into my heart. Make me born again. Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the son of the living God. You died on the cross for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And on the third day, you rose again from the dead with all power and authority in your hand. And you're now seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And I believe you, Lord. I trust you with my life. I give you my old life and I receive new life in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, giving me eternal life. And now, Lord, I pray that you equip me and make me a vessel of honor for you. Use me, Lord, in the earth as your instrument to bring you glory and to bring other souls to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, listen, if you just prayed that prayer, I believe if you were sincere that you just got saved. You are born again. And the spirit of the Lord is going to bear witness with your spirit that you are born again. Listen, read your word every day. Pray to God. Talk to him every day, all day. And stay tuned in to good Christian teaching. Amen. To keep yourself built up on your most holy faith and ask God to fill you with his spirit. Don't settle for anything less than to have your cup running over. Amen. Well, listen, thank you for tuning in to the Bible study tonight. If the Lord puts it on your heart to give, you can give by texting TCH give to the number 77 nine seven seven or you can cash out dollar sign tch give amen you, all right we love you and we're praying for you listen stay prayerful stay in the spirit there's a lot going on in the world today but don't allow anything to take your eyes off jesus keep your focus on the Lord. Amen. And we'll see you Sunday morning at 11 a.m.
God bless you, everybody.